Welcome to SciStarter Live. We are talking specifically to the Mariah Mitchell Association through uh, Janelle, who's here to talk about her work and how citizen science interacts with it too. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and let her introduce herself a little bit better um, and spotlight you so that you can also share your screen when you're ready. Perfect. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Emma, thank you for welcoming me. Are you hearing an echo on your end? Very minor, but a little bit of one. I'm not sure how. <laughs> how about now? Oh, yeah, perfect. Perfect, that is what we love. All right, as Emma said, I'm Janelle Gurley, and I'm currently the Director of Science and Programs with an educational focus as well at the Nantucket Mara Mitchell Association. And it is my esteemed pleasure to gather with you guys here today for this virtual SciStarter collaboration with MMA. So thank you again for having me. And just to kick it off, I think, you know, my bio hit most of my points. As Emma mentioned, I'm a previous high school educator in math and science, and I spent about seven years educating in the Nantucket High School public system. And I, you know, was afforded the opportunity to explore this role as director of science and programs at the Murray Mitchell Association to really connect not just kids to opportunities with, within our ecosystem and community to the nature of Nantucket, but also to open up opportunities for them beyond Nantucket. And that's something that I'm really passionate about is creating opportunities for learners of all ages to really have a hands-on learning experience, especially given that Nantucket is, as I described, a little sandbar on this, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean rather, that it's just a sandbox for science. It's my description for Nantucket. And to be able to give kids the opportunity to see their light bulbs go off is something that I just, I feel really strongly about. And I'm happy to be able to do that in a different capacity as I was able to, as a classroom educator, All right? So today, with it being Women's History Month, I'm going to share with you guys a little bit about the legacy of Maria Mitchell, as well as some of our community science or citizen science projects that you guys can hopefully get involved with and help us advance knowledge in the science arena. So to begin, I wanted to share one of my most favorite quotes from Maria Mitchell. And that quote is here on this slide. Women are needed in scientific work for the very reason that a woman's method is different from that of a man. All of her nice perceptions of minute details, all of her delicate observation of color, of form, of shape, of change, and her capability of patient routine would be of immense value in the collection of scientific facts. So a little bit of context, she said this back in the 1800s, and for us to be where we are today in the scientific field and to see how many women have gone on from that time to be involved and to be so influential on the scientific realm, this one really just resonates with me that our roles were so reduced in some social capacities back in that time that these really refined skills that ended up being really transferable to science, it just really resonates with me that she was able to make that connection at that delicate time and intersection in history. And I have to remember which computer I'm switching my slides from. <laughs> So a little bit about Mariah Mitchell. So Mariah, although it's spelled Maria, it's phonetically pronounced Mariah. She was born on August 1st in 1818 and she was born into a large Quaker family. She was one of 10 kids here on Nantucket Island. And it's really important for us to understand the time at which she was born. She was born in a time where women didn't really have a role in the field of education or in the role in the field of science rather women were expected to be housemakers and to tend to their husbands and to their children. And this is really important to mention because being born into a Quaker family meant that all of the kids in the household had an equal opportunity toward education. And this was really influential on Mariah's upbringing. She grew up in a family that valued education for all of their children, regardless of their gender. And she was able to spend a lot of her time outdoors, learning about the natural world around her. She was very fortunate to have two parents that created this rich learning opportunity for her not just to learn more about the natural world, but to also investigate scientific concepts, mathematical principles, as well as art, history, literature of that time. 
At the tender age of 12, she actually assisted her father in ca the calculation of the exact duration of the 1830 solar eclipse, which was an annular eclipse. We we'll had to mention that because we're coming up on an eclipse season and another great North American eclipse on April 8th. So had to throw that in there. But it was because of her work in helping him calculate the duration of this eclipse that their home here in Nantucket was deemed an, an, a legitimate observatory. She would then go on to complete her secondary schooling and later become a teaching assistant to one of her teachers at her all-girls school, Cyrus Pierce School here on Nantucket. And subsequently, for a year later, she actually ran her own inclusive school where she welcomed African-American students as well, which again, given the time period of history, that was really huge and something that was pioneering here on Nantucket Island compared to the other parts of the United States. And my slides, there we go. <laughs> a little bit more of background and history of her young adulthood and some of her accomplishments. Because she was really astute and she displayed an early show of talent in both the math and science fields, she was able to learn from her father to use various astronomical tools, things like chronometers, as well as a doll and telescope, equatorial telescope. She just had a chronometers as well, if I didn't say that already, sextants. She had a great exposure to these nautical and navigational tools from a really young age. And she was she was really able to pick up and have a knack, a natural knack for operating these tools and supporting his amateur astronomy observations, right? So it's important to note that her father was a huge inspiration for her in be going on to become or to be described as a professional woman astronomer here in the United States. Earlier in her childhood, or rather in her young adulthood, at the age of 18, she went on to become the first librarian at the Nantucket Athenaeum, which is our local library. And she held that post for about 20 years, which is a long time, especially for a woman to be in that role. Again, considering the time in history and given the climate of Nantucket at that point, which we were a huge whaling society and a whaling hub for the entire world, men would be gone to sea for a really long time, sometimes years at different points. And this community was ahead of the charge in having a role for women in society. Women ran the books of their households. They even combined households when their husbands were out at sea to make sure that kids were taken care of, to make sure that, again, the finances, the bills were paid and you, all of the things were tended to. So it's really important to consider that she was able to hold such a prominent position at a very young age in her career and for such a long duration of time. And it was notably during her tenure as the librarian at the Athenaeum that she was able to continue supporting her father's amateur astronomy, astronomical observations rather, as well as his geographical calculations for the US, US Coast Survey. And she was able to do this because the library had limited hours and they had a small membership. So when the library was closed or when they didn't have anyone coming through the doors, she was able to further her own education and continue reading her and rather really nourishing her voracious appetite for learning. And in the evening times, once the library was definitely closed, she would join her father at the top of the Pacific National Bank, which is at the top of Main Street here on Nantucket, in their what I call makeshift observatory, but it really was a great observatory for them in that period of time that she would continue to support his work and assist him in the evening time. So she had a full schedule. She was a really busy woman, <laughs> so to speak. So on 1847, and one of the things that she's most you know, well known for in today's world is that she discovered she was the first female American astronomer and deemed so because of this discovery in 1847 on October 1st, she spotted a fuzzy object in the sky with her telescope. And it was abnormal and unusual for her because she has, she was able rather to have a really distinct memory of what the night sky looked like at different points in the year. And it was either to the left or to the right of Polaris or the North Star, and I forget exactly, that she noticed this fuzzy object and she was like, ah, something doesn't look right. This is abnormal. And she ran to grab her father, gave it a second look, and she realized that what she was seeing was a comet. 
and this comet was a pretty unusual comet in the sense that it was a hyper a hyperbolic sunbound comet, which means that it shot into our universe, into our viewpoint rather, and then it left our viewpoints on a trajectory moving further away from us, never to be seen again, which I think is pretty neat that you have comets that can shoot in, is visible for a period of time, and then it's going to continue moving further and further away from us, never to be seen in this space and time again. Space is pretty awesome. <laughs> and it was for this discovery that she was awarded the gold medal by the King of Denmark. And she didn't actually receive that award till 1848 and 1849, because there was a little contentious, a contentious climate around this discovery. So because, again, she didn't have a formal collegiate education at this point. She was an amateur astronomer by rights of description. And really her father was the astronomer at that time, right? That was her viewpoint that dad's the astronomer, I'm his assistant, I saw this thing. They recorded that information in her records as her father having made this discovery or her supporting her father. And in order to get this gold medal, you really, it's not just about making the discovery, it's also about the reporting piece, the scientific communication. So because she didn't report it right away to the King of Denmark, someone else, Francesco de Vico, he actually reported it first, even though he didn't discover it first. And he initially was credited with that discovery, but because of her father's close relationship with the Bond brothers of what was Harvard College, is now Harvard University, and their capacity to connect with people across the Atlantic, they were able to prove that Mariah, in fact, made this discovery. And this was huge because she was the first American and the first female astronomer to be to receive that accolade. So I think that that's pretty neat. <laughs> it was at age 30 that she was admitted to the Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she was the first woman to be honored as such. Two years later, she became a member of the Association of Advancement of Science, and she performed calculations and different tabulations for the planet Venus during her tenure with the U.S. Nautical Almanac Office. And this is important to note because this was really important for nautical navigation. So again, people, or we all rather, we think of astronomy, we think of the sky, we think of space, we think of studying the cosmos, but in that time, astronomical observation was of paramount importance to nautical navigation. And again, setting that theme of we're in the 1800s heading in, you know, prepping for the 1900s, whaling was still a really huge means of merchant services. So it, a lot of people were using the Atlantic Ocean and all the seas rather to, tra to travel, to navigate. So it was really important, the work that her and her father had set or embarked upon because it meant so much more than just learning about the sky. It was a really useful utilitarian tool to keep sailors safe as they navigated and to ensure that they came back home. And more about Mariah, she went on to become the first professor hired at Vassar College in 1865. And Vassar is an all women's college. And it was here that she really refined and honed her skills as an educator. And what she really focused on as some people would describe her unconventional teaching methods or pedagogical instructional methods of teaching by the means of learning by doing, which is something that we as an association today is still committed to. Your ability or your capacity to retain information or to just have a different ex educational experience, if you can do the act, really speaks to her being ahead of her time. Because again, we didn't have all of the fancy psychological principles that we rely on today for educational purposes. And she was doing this in real time in the 1800s. And Vassar really gave her the scope and the latitude to practice and to teach the way that she felt strongly about. And I, again, I think it's really important to note that she was the first professor hired and she was the first female professor of astronomy, which again, in this time period, a pioneer in her field. She spent a lot of her time, her free time, of course, because she wasn't busy at all, advocating for the rights of women as well as the abolition of slavery. She continued to research planets and to photograph stars. She became the first woman to be elected to the American Philosophical Society. And it was two years later that she helped to found the American Association for the Advancement of Women. And she went on to serve as their president for about two years. And she was also 
rather, she also attended the first meeting of the Women's Congress in 1873, because again, she spent a lot of her time, she was really committed to the suffrage movement. She was really committed to the equity of women, not just in the scientific field, but in the workplace. In her time at Vassar, she had discovered that she was being paid significantly less than her male counterparts. And she, this was work, all of her work or all of her activism was really in her backyard. So for instance, the abolitionist movement, Nantucket was a huge hub again for spreading the message of the abolition of slavery. So she had direct contact with Frederick Douglass, for example. She had direct contact with suffragettes when they visited Nantucket. So the work that she was really impassioned by was really in her backyard and she was really convicted and really felt strongly about the importance of this work. And she had that firsthand experience at Vassar being, you know, deemed as inequitable to her male counterparts, even though she was more accomplished in a lot of ways than some of these men with collegiate degrees. And unfortunately, in 1888, she retired from Vassar College a year before she passed away, and she passed away due to brain disease called encephalopathy at the age of 70. Her family brought her body back to Nantucket at the Prospect Hill Cemetery here on Nantucket, the Quaker Cemetery, so that she could be laid to rest with all of her family. But again, her accolades didn't stop. Her, her pioneering didn't end when she left this physical realm. It, you know, we are lucky in today's climate as the Moran Mitchell Association to continue preserving her legacy and sharing with others the work that she's really trailblazed for others in the scientific field. So in 1902, our organization was founded and it was founded by family, friends and students of Mariah Mitchell. And again, that goal is to preserve her legacy as well as her contributions as not just an astronomer, but as an educator, a naturalist, as well as a librarian, because she was equally all of those things. She may, may have been most you know, famously known for her comet discovery. However, all of the other roles that she held over the course of her life made her a phenomenal astronomer. Her having that educational background transformed the lives of many women and just many students of hers. And without having those other parts of her, we can't really say what the impact of her astronomical significance would be today, or at least we'd be remiss in not including those equally important parts of who she was as a person. And our founding or our guiding ethos or principle at the organization is to promote the idea of learning by doing. So through all of our programs, all of our activities, all of our offerings, it's the center of what we do. We really feel strongly about giving learners of all ages an opportunity to develop a lifelong passion for science through education initiatives, through research opportunities, and really the firsthand exploration of the skyline and sea of Nantucket. And I will be on mission statement there for everyone. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that I imparted with everyone that she lived in a time of great, a time and a place rather, of great intersection of the natural sciences, art, and history. And it really is our privilege and our honor to preserve her legacy and to continue to highlight her noteworthy achievements and her contributions to all of her areas of study or focus. <laughs> and if I'm talking too fast, Emma, you can tell me because sometimes I get excited. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm going to pause you for a second just so we can answer some of the questions that are relevant to the previous slide. Of slides. course. Um, yes. Taylor had a bunch of really good questions about a little bit more nuanced about uh about Mariah's life. I'm curious if we know, did she um, supplement her studies about astronomy as a librarian, like through reading books on there? Is there any knowledge about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yes, she did. She literally, every minute she had to soak up reading about literally anything, she seized that opportunity. So yes, it is safe to say yes, she did. <laughs> awesome. Just the epitome of the sponge. <laughs> getting all of your information um did she do any other uh discoveries uh like you said you mentioned that she continued photographing stars and doing mm -hmm. more astronomy is she credited with any other uh discoveries or is it mostly just the comet that's so most famously the comet but i do know that she was one of the first astronomers to also delineate the composition of the chemical composition of stars so i me as a former 
chemist that stood out to me. So that one I can speak to, but I can't speak to all of the nitty gritties of her discoveries. But I can get the answer for you guys. <laughs> I can't even fathom trying to figure that out, to be honest. <laughs> like the starting point of that. <laughs> and to think of the time that she was doing this in, like, again, calculating the position of Venus in the night sky and tabling it. Again, just thinking of where we are in technological advancement compared to what it was then, being able to do that to me is just uber impressive. I, I can't even. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you know if, along with all of her other work, uh, talking to the suffragettes, um, did she march in any of the, or take part in any of the suffrage movements other than connection with them in Nantucket? So it's unconfirmed some of her participation. So one thing that I didn't touch on that I had hoped someone would ask about is that Nantucket suffered a really great fire and it, the town was almost a total loss, the downtown area. So a lot of her personal experiences and her diaries, actually, we can't really pinpoint a lot of her personal life and her personal attachments to these things. It's just like the specific points that we do know, because during the Great Fire, one of the things that really affected her was from the steps of the Athenaeum, there were just people papers like their personal diaries and their discoveries and things that were really intimate for a lot of people were being strewn about the streets and people were learning things about people and again this was a delicate time and across intersectional time for a lot of people and she actually destroyed some of her own writings because she was fearful that another fire would happen and this could happen to her so it's really hard to say exactly what she did to support some of these movements outside of the fact that her being here and having access to the Athenaeum, bringing a lot of these people to speak on Nantucket, it's hard to articulate what she did outside of that. But she was a key figure in bringing a lot of these people to Nantucket and also hosting and entertaining them while they were here. Wow, that is really interesting. I, I mean, that concept of burning your own work <laughs> definitely speaks right. to a different uh well I guess I don't know it's a little bit relatable <laughs> um, and then there was a question about uh Frederick Douglass if they were in communication would you have considered them good friends Taylor asked. I again it's hard to speak for someone I would consider them to be more than amicable because again it was important to her that he came here to speak and again she had participation in making that happen so I can't, again, without her most intimate writings, I don't know that I can speak on her behalf and say that they were good friends. I would hope that they were. And I, <laughs> you know, I, I would imagine that that is a, a large possibility. <laughs> awesome. I'll pause there and wait on the last one for now, because I think that's a good one for the end. But um, okay. thank you so much for pausing for all those questions. And thanks, Taylor, for all those cool questions. I'm glad you're thinking about these things. I love these questions. Definitely. <laughs> All right, we hit that one. So moving us into kind of where we are and how we're connected with SciStarter. So Emma actually, you know, pointed out to me because I've worked at the Maria Mitchell Association for the last, I'm coming up on two years this summer and I'm still uncovering all of the depths of the work that we do. We are a very multifaceted organization. And Emma actually reached out and noted the, the cross-section of us with SciStarter, which then I started looking into SciStarter. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a really cool organization. I love the work that you guys are doing. And it uncovered this whole other arm of what we do and how we can continue to support community. And forgive me, I say community science and it's still citizen science. And I won't bore us with the definition for community science because Emma already gracefully touched on that. But I will share that Citizen science and community science is a great way for many people to discover or rediscover some of their hidden skills or passions as they relate to science. And we as the Mariah Mitchell Association, we support a variety of different community science projects. We have our Green Crab Survey Project, our Nantucket Based Scholar Research Project, which is more of a student mentoring project than it is a survey project as well as our Horseshoe Crab Survey Project. And we are able to do this in collaboration with some other local organizations. Nantucket is really rich in history as well as rich in community. And 
we are one of the oldest nonprofits on Nantucket, but we are so blessed today to have about a hundred different nonprofits on Nantucket and a lot of them having an environmental focus that we are able to form these great relationships with other organizations to do the important work of recording all of the native species in the historical record of the island and really monitoring, especially climate change and the impacts of climate change over time. So no noteworthy mention is that the NBI or the Nantucket Biodiversity Initiative was founded with the Mariah Mitchell Association and it has evolved over the last 22 years roughly from its initial thought inception to encompass all of these nonprofit organizations or representatives from each nonprofit organization that volunteer, we volunteer our time to not just further our own missions, but to come together and really give a seat at the table to every organization to discuss what can we do to make Nantucket better? What can we do to protect the di biodiversity, sorry, of Nantucket? And how do we get more people invested in protecting the biodiversity of Nantucket. And the way that our organizations are all able to do that is through community science and citizen science projects. So again, when Emma reached out, I was like, oh my gosh, there's no way that I can't not make this happen because citizen science is so important, not just for the person doing citizen science, but a lot of scientific concepts or conjectures or principles wouldn't be possible without the work of citizen scientists. And no one is what's the word I'm looking for? There's no prerequisite, I guess is what I'm trying to say for citizen science. You just have to have an interest. So that led me to this second portion of our presentation, connecting Ryan Mitchell to citizen science. So before we progress, and I talk about specifically our green crab survey project, it's important for us to consider what an invasive species is. So an invasive species is a plant, animal, or other organism organism, I get excited and I eat my words, that is introduced to a certain environment or ecosystem outside of its native range. So it's a, an alien in a brand new ecosystem, essentially. And why it's important to know what an invasive species is, is because it can cause not just economic and environmental harm, but they can also potentially harm human health. And they take away resources from native species and they're often introduced by dun, 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 humans, right? Sometimes I think of us as an invasive species on our own planet. <laughs> Bringing us to the European green crab, Crescentus manus, which is an invasive species that destroys habitats by cutting into eelgrass roots. They take food resources away from native crab species like spider crabs and blue crabs here on Nantucket due to their diverse diet. They are scavengers and they will eat literally anything. And because they have no natural predator on the Eastern seaboard, given that they're from Europe originally, and they began migrating or rather began being introduced into our ecosystems here in about the 1800s, again, because they have no natural predators and there's a myriad of things available to them in this new ecosystem, they will eat anything. They're able to tolerate a wide range of ocean temperatures, which means that they don't have a high level of discrimination for where what spaces they will occupy in the marine sphere. And I mentioned they have very few predators since they are fast moving and they're aggressive hunters, but I would say they're very few natural predators because they're not native to these ecosystems. They're also, they also cause a reduction in the local biodiversity by consuming various types of shellfish. And for us here on Nantucket, the Nantucket Bay Scallop, we have been one of the last commercial wild fisheries on the eastern seaboard. And since the increase in populations of invasive green crabs, we have, again, can't prove causation, but there's a correlation with their increased population that we've had a decrease in our base scallop population. Again, for a myriad of reasons that has been happening. And through our scallop research project, we've been studying some of those parameters as well. I can't prove causation and, or rather we can prove causation that it's due to the green crabs, but they definitely impact the population of the Nantucket base scallop, which depends on the eelgrass on the sea floor to safely be able to spawn and go through their full life cycle. 
bringing us to Moran Mitchell Association, Green Crab Week. So one of the ways that we support community science is that every August we, and this is the fifth year that we're doing it, we host what is called the Green Crab Week, which is a fun and informative week of programming that's centered around our community science invasive crab survey project. This is done in collaboration with two other local nonprofits, Sustainable Nantucket, as well as Nantucket Land and Water Council. Events will include chances to hunt, capture, recycle, and even eat green crabs. I am not a green crab aficionado. I not going to say that I would enjoy eating them and I have not tried them, but people have reported that they are delicious. <laughs> we even have a green crab cookbook that a lot of people are, you know, trying different recipes to see what they can do with the green crab dish. And I had a quick video that we made a few years back that I thought that I would share with you guys. Emma, is it okay if we share a video? How are we doing on time? We have about four minutes in this video. Uh, yeah, we should be okay. We're at okay. 20 minutes still. Yeah. Awesome. Although I'll let you know about the sound because it sounds like either the audio has not started Green yet or crab oh, survey. Just kidding. <laughs> this survey will <laughs> association. We're very excited to announce a brand new citizen science survey called the Nantucket Green Crab Survey. This survey will challenge community members to go out into our local waters and look for green crabs. Then if you fill out a data sheet and send it to us, we can track the movements and abundance of green crabs throughout Nantucket and hopefully use that data to plan new green crab activities and research. So let's get right into the video. The first thing you'll need to get started is a letter of authorization from the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. To find that information, you can visit us at mariahmitchell.org, go to Get Involved, and go to our Green Crab page. Once here, you can scroll all the way down to Additional Resources and click on Massachusetts Saltwater Fishing Regulations. This will include how to get a letter of authorization for collecting green crabs. Once you're at mass.gov, scroll all the way down until we get to recreational crab regulations. And then you'll see here under invasive crabs, we get the directions of how to request a letter of authorization and the phone number and email to request a letter of authorization is on the screen now. The next thing we need is a copy of our data sheet. Once again, we're going to go to Get Involved and go to our Green Crab page. Once here, we'll scroll all the way down to Nantucket Green Crab Week 2020, and a link to our data sheet will be under the Wednesday events. You can also continue to scroll down to additional resources, and you can click on Nantucket Green Crab Survey and Identification Guide. This should readily open in any browser on a computer or smartphone. Once here, you'll see basic directions about how to complete the survey, the data sheet below, as well as an area of interest map that will show you the best places to do your survey, in addition to the Nantucket Green Crab Identification Guide, which will help you distinguish the invasive European green crab from our native crab species. So let's go over the equipment you'll need to do a Nantucket Green Crab Survey. There are three methods of looking for crabs. The first one is wading in the water. For that, you'll need a hand net, a bucket, and a way to tell time. You can also collect green crabs with bait and a hand line. For that, you'll need some sort of rope as a hand line, and you'll need bait. Chicken drumsticks seem to work really well for this. The last method is to go snorkeling. If you go snorkeling, you'll need all of your snorkel gear, including your mask, fin, and snorkel, we also highly recommend you bring a dive flag and a mesh bag works great for collecting crabs underwater. Now you can start the green crab survey. Make a note of your start time and then try to look for crabs for at least 30 minutes. You don't have to follow a particular pattern when you're looking for crabs. Just collect as many as you can. Once you're done collecting, make a note of your end time and count your crabs. Now we can fill out the data sheet. Once you have it downloaded, fill out the fields to the best of your knowledge. 
If you don't know the tide, that's okay, we can look it up later and you can leave it blank. As an example, I'm filling out the data sheet for a survey I did recently. I'm coming back to that. We have some uh, echo a little bit, but not too bad. How about now? I think it's better. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I just stopped it ahead of the survey because I had two different videos. It's not the first one that I wanted to share, but it's perfectly fine because it just introduces kind of how we jump right into that survey project. And I skipped ahead on those slides. Where did you go? I promise I'm more technologically proficient than this. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so I was just talking about our Green Crab Week. So again, outside of Green Crab Week, this is not the only time that we focus on the Green Crab Survey. We actually go out at minimum three times a year to make sure that we're recording and surveying the green crabs on Nantucket. And again, we do this in collaboration with some other organizations so that we split up the geosphere of the island in which we do that. We tend to go on the northern side of the island, more of the sheltered side, because it's easier to survey, especially from a citizen science standpoint, to go in and wade in the water or be able to snorkel safely as the south shore of the island tends to have more waves. So we've seen more green crab activity definitely on the harbor side of the island, if that is helpful to note. And just some other citizen science projects or community science projects that we support, as I mentioned, the Nantucket Bay Scholar Project. This is more of a research and mentoring project. Again, learning by doing. Dr. Val Hall, one of our research associates who just retired this year, this past December rather, she this was one of her passion projects. She was also a former Nantucket High School educator for marine sciences, and she concepted out this project to be able not to just give back to the community, but to create an opportunity for Nantucket kids primarily, as well as then for other kids to have a real research opportunity in science before they got to college. So that's kind of been the heart of that program. And it's now been a longitudinal study to understand scallop longevity, their reproductive cycles, as well as their ability to survive given the changes in their habitats. And some of those noteworthy changes are the decline of eel glass, eel grass population, as well as changing temperature, changing pH of the Nantucket Harbor, as well as the fertilizer runoff in the harbor. So there are a lot of different factors that we're working against. And we can't attribute the decline of eelgrass specifically to the green crabs, but again, it's one of those parameters that we've seen some correlation in or correlation to with regard to the Nantucket Bay scallop. We also a few years ago began our horseshoe crab survey project and each year volunteers head out during the high tides around the full and new moons in April, May and June to count horseshoe crabs along the east coast. The MMA is responsible for Monomoy Beach, which is one of our sheltered beaches on the harbor side of the island, while UMass Field Station, so UMass Boston has a field station here on Nantucket, they survey the beach right in front of their field station, which is a little bit more north, in a northern orientation than Monomoy Beach. And Nantucket Conservation Foundation surveys Eel Point, which is more on the northwestern end of the island. So we're kind of covering the northwest east to west corridor of Nantucket. And all of this data for the Green Crab Survey Project as well as a Horseshoe Crab Survey Project is submitted to the Massachusetts Regional Offices for processing. And we're always looking for volunteers to help us with these surveys. So if you're on Nantucket this summer, definitely come find us or email me. And if you'd like to get involved, we're always looking for participation. And I'd be remiss in not stating that Nantucket is not the only place that this surveying and monitoring can be done. I recommend strongly looking up on SciStarter what are some other organizations or where are there opportunities to survey green crabs maybe in your backyard or your neighborhood. <laughs> and we, I'm jumping ahead on my slides. We encourage you to find out more about opportunities that vary in range and scale from local to global to universal. It just depends on where you are in your citizen science career. And in some instances, you can even help with projects directly from your home. Again, with technological advancement today, you don't always have to be on site to perform community science. You could likely do this from your location. 
So again, as I mentioned, SciStart is a great place to start. And there are many other organizations that are also dedicated to being a hub for citizen science projects. And it is, it wouldn't be possible to advance our scientific knowledge without the participation of citizen scientists. So help us advance scientific knowledge from your location, or even if you're here in Nantucket this summer or in the future, we'd love to have you in support of our projects. <laughs> and that was all I had planned for you guys today. So hopefully that hit the mark. <laughs> that is amazing. Thanks for sharing all that information with us. I'm glad too that you're, uh, the description of, you don't have to be on Nantucket Island to do a lot of these projects, right? But if you're there, I, I personally am thinking, how do I get out there at some point this summer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Making the plan in my brain right now. Um, there are a ton of ways that you can participate in your own backyard um, based on your own uh, your own environment too, especially with invasive species, since that was a bigger topic um, mm -hmm. for these ones, for the green crab. Uh, we actually had an event, I wrote it in the chat too, for anyone who was interested. If you're looking for projects that are connected to invasive species that might be closer to you. Um, it's all very specific to environments, right? Because it's only mm -hmm. invasive it's in the wrong spot. So right. if you're looking on SciStarter, for example, we give tips during that um, during that uh, YouTube video I linked there about where to look um, for resources regarding that and also where to look on SciStarter, how to look for um, projects that might be more related to your protecting native species and um, looking for, searching for, helping prevent um, extensive issues with uh, invasive species, including don't let your exotic snake loose in the jungle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was amazed to find out how often that happens. <laughs> Too often. <laughs> Too often, seriously. Um, there were a couple of comments I wanted to bring up to hear your thoughts about them. Um, okay. Rob Hershon, who's the one who actually told me to reach out to you, so he's a <laughs> homie in general. Um, he oh. wanted to uh, make a point that he's been looking forward to uh, August 1st becoming a Mariah Mitchell day. Is the Mariah Mitchell Association working on that in, in any way or does anything on, on August 1st to celebrate? So we haven't formally, you know, declared it Mariah Mitchell day, but we have for over 200 years honored her on her birthday. So we do a, a full block party here on our Vessel Street campus, which is under construction right now, which is why I'm doing this from home because they've torn up the whole street. It's quite a sight, but it's supposed to be better once they're done. And we're super excited about that. But we literally shut down all of Vessel Street, which is in front of her birthplace house, in front of the original observatory, as well as our Natural Science Museum Research Center and our administrative offices. And we open it up to the public to just kind of honor her for her birthday. So for us here on Nantucket, it is Mariah Mitchell Day. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, hopefully we can get the whole the whole world to participate at some point. We'll I would love it. that. <laughs> <laughs> it would be great. I think that would be really cool. We're trying to do the same thing for um, Citizen Science Month. So eventually, yeah, yeah it's all those. Well, we can team up and we can figure that out together. <laughs> exactly. Yes, it's a plan. Um, and then Bob actually had another question or a specific question about um, astronomy related SITSI. Mm -hmm. Has the Murray Mitchell uh, Museum or the Association in general ever done projects like Globe at Night or anything astronomy focused uh, as a part of the museum or um, yeah, I mean, so for viewers too? If, yeah, we do some and if it's a question in the Q&A, so I can see it. Okay. Yes. Any astronomy related SITSI at the Murray Mitchell Museum, maybe Globe at Night or others? Yeah, so again, I've been here for two years, and from what I can see, we have not had a whole ton of citizen science projects. In astronomy, we have, for the last few years, have had a really strong focus on NSF REU experiences, research opportunities, educational opportunities for collegiate level students. However, we do partner with a local organization called Nantucket Lights, and Nantucket Lights has been doing a lot of work to monitor the lighting quality on Nantucket, and they've actually been working on a lot of bylaws and getting support for bylaws to improve exterior lighting here on, on island, because Nantucket is one of the few remaining places on the eastern seaboard where you can still see the Milky Way pretty clearly. And I'm, think, I'm imagining the scale we're literally a couple of points above like optimal viewing, but we're approaching a cusp that would more like pollution. We could potentially not see the, the night sky as we've always been able to. And again, important to note because these are the same skies that Mariah was able to make such, you know, impressive discoveries. 
viewing, right? So being able to protect our dark skies is of extreme importance to us. We have, again, partnered with Nantucket Lights, Gail Walker at Nantucket Lights, and it's something that I'd like to see us bring back to have more opportunities in community and citizen science across the fields outside of marine biology or marine ecology. So it's on my list, Bob. <laughs> That is awesome. I'm very glad. Um, yeah, Globinite is a great one for that. For anyone who doesn't know what yeah. that is, by the way, it's a uh, um, it's a project in which you're essentially searching for constellations, you're stargazing, but mm -hmm. as a dual uh, task within it, you're also defining how many stars you see um, in right. the night sky within that constellation to see what the level of light pollution is um, mm -hmm. in that spot, which I struggle with that project just because I lose track of which stars I'm looking at every like yep. seconds. Um, so it is just challenging for me. I ended up, our library program uses um, that project and has those devices that are um, um, their sky quality meters. So if you're lucky yep. enough to be near a library with a sky quality meter, or if you have one at a nearby organization, um, mm -hmm. those are also really good ways to, um, to monitor that too. Uh, actually, because you said, yep, I'm just curious, do you have those materials at the museum? So we do, and I, I would be remiss in not stating, so even though we're not doing community science related focused projects right now, our director of astronomy, Regina Jorgensen, she has, you know, formed that partnership with Nantucket Lights and she actually volunteers. So in theory, yes, she's a citizen scientist as well as a professional scientist mm -hmm. serving or rather serving in that capacity to do some light quality and light pollution monitoring because she uses some of those SQM meters <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, yeah, the proper term SQM dash L or whatever. <laughs> yes, very technical. <laughs> but I did want to note that outside of citizen science, we one of our focuses has been, especially for the local community, because we're such a diverse community, I think it's often or it's easy to think of Nantucket as a mono-ethnicity island, but given the last, especially the last 10 years, we have had migration of so many different types of people here on Nantucket that we have a very blended school system and we have a robust Spanish speaking or rather just a non-English speaking population. Mm -hmm. And it's outside of Spanish, outside of Portuguese. We also have some Nepalese speakers, Eastern European, so very blended society. So one of our focuses has been community science in the sense of community outreach. So we create opportunities. We have this free program called Look Up at our Loins Observatory, where we open it up to all community members and it's free of charge. They can come up to the observatory and learn about constellations, do constellation tours, take their first gaze through a telescope, look a little bit deeper into the cosmos and see a cluster of nebulae or nebulae or a cluster of stars. Um, so that's kind of been our focus in the last few years and with regard to the astronomical piece. And like I said, I'm looking for ways to grow our community science outside of the marine ecological focus. That's awesome. I'm excited. It sounds like you're setting up the foundation to some excellent, excellent things. And also people who are somewhat familiar too with topics too. So they'll be really, really mm -hmm. strong uh, citizen scientists too, or community Definitely. scientists. <laughs> participatory scientists, all of the above. There's so all many. All of the great words. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I apologize because there are a ton of questions that I don't know if we'll have time to answer, but I did want to ask for uh, for anyone who's looking for more information about Mariah, um, mm -hmm. more information about um, a lot of things she, she was involved in, where would mm -hmm. you send them to look? Would that be the, the association website? Or okay. Yes, to us. Yeah. Definitely reach out to us. So Jason Leonardo Finger, our deputy director and curator of the Mitchell House, she has worked for the Mariah Mitchell Association since she was a child. And we won't say how old she is now. She's very many years young, but she self-describes that she's been there for a really long time. But she really is a depth and a breadth of knowledge on all things Mariah Mitchell. And if she cannot find the answer for you, then I'm not sure who else would. So really, we are the best resource for all things Mariah Mitchell. So coming to the website, reaching out to anybody on our team, really. And if, for instance, if I can't answer something specifically, she's the person that I would talk to or that I would put you into contact with. So definitely us. Excellent. Um, do you mind if I add your email then to the follow-up? Of email? course. Yeah, okay. of course. All right. So for all of you who registered, which is everyone on the Zoom calling, uh, you'll see that tomorrow too. So you can get that information. Uh, when you need it. Let me just scroll just in case I did not answer or if there's any that are more pertinent. Um, While you scroll, I can quickly share where the, the green crabs come from. So they were in the ballast, the water in the ballast of ships coming from Europe. So that's where they were thought to, how they made their way across the Atlantic. <laughs> oh man, long trip. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, are there <laughs> any? Party. Yeah. Uh, are there any uh, species that are natural predators of those green crabs? You know? you know, I do not know the answer to that. I will attest that I'm a chemist by nature. So biology is not my strong focus, but I'm sure that they have a natural predator. I just don't. On In our current climate, where we are located, no, they do not. So here on Nantucket, the answer is no. Which is exactly why that project exists, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to help prevent them spreading too much. Um, there were a couple comments about books. If there's any recommendations you have for reading books about Mariah? Yeah, there's one book that came to mind when I saw that question. It's called What Miss Mitchell Saw, and it's more of a children's book, but I believe that the question was a little bit aligned with a children's focus, and I think that that one's an excellent book for kids to learn about Mariah Mitchell. Um, and really, I recommend, again, on within our special archives and collections, we have a lot of her, what is left of her papers and some of her excerpts of writing. I think that those are the best ways to really learn about Mariah Mitchell. So I would do that shameless plug for us. <laughs> Not shameless at all. And we will plug it in the, in the follow-up email, I promise. <laughs> Yeah. These are all excellent questions. If you still have burning curiosity about anything, uh, Taylor, just nodding to you for a moment, uh, go ahead and send some messages to, or send an email to um, the association through Janelle so that we can get your answers for you. Sorry, there's, or possibly Google for some of these. Um, <laughs> maybe, I don't know where, uh, or the, like what the- Most of Google yeah. will lead you back to us, so. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so I can close this out. Yep. And one of them is about uh, your site. So if you were looking for where to go for uh, those community science projects, there is the site mariahmitchell.org slash citizen dash science. And you can go to that one um, to see the green crab project from previous years. Um, and you said that it would be updated to for this August coming up. Soon. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we'll be excited to see that. And when it is updated, we'll add it to SciStar so you'll be able to find it there too, uh, which would be awesome. great to see. <laughs> Um, and then, as I said before, invasive species related projects, uh, you can go to our SciStarter starter finder to find the local ones closer to you if you're not near uh, Nantucket. Um, but there's a million other biodiversity projects you can also take part in. Um, all right, I'm going to click a button that'll hopefully, there we go. Um, oh, before we do that, um, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us as our guest speaker. I appreciate you making the time and I've learned so much. Um, I'm very excited to uh, make a point to get out there. I need to figure out when I can do that because it looks beautiful too. So just let me know when you're ready. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for everyone who's here with us, thanks for staying on. I know I'm a minute over, so I'll be very brief here, but we have these events pretty much every week. So if you want to join us again next week, we're talking about eclipses. The week after that, we're still talking about the eclipse, um, but these are projects that you can, for the most part, do in a lot of places. So if you're uh, if you are not on the central path, there is a possibility that you can still do these projects, specifically um, the one on the April 2nd that we're talking about. That'll be a good one for you. Um, and it's Eclipse Day on April 8th, and then we switch gears and Citizen Science Month starts. So if you are at all intrigued about any of these projects or participating in any science during the month of April, it is the best time to start because we're aiming for 1 million acts of science, which is 1 million data points uh, sent on to scientists. And so this is a really, really big push. We want everyone involved. Newbies completely welcome. You don't need any prior experience. So if you're looking for a way to get started, it is the time. Um, and you can actually visit our website to get more information about that. Um, that Roland just dropped for us there too. Excellent. We have a ton of resources. You can use them. Uh, you don't have to use all of them, but they do exist. So here's all those things. And uh, Roland's dropping those links in the chat for you too. Big key points here are the trainings to help you with like the ego boost and confidence boost and our email to ask any questions if we didn't finish uh, answering your questions at all. Um, but you'll get your uh, follow-up email tomorrow as well to get a little bit more information and the recording too if you are watching this later. Hello. So we are so happy to have you all here. We'll, oh, and our podcast, which Bob, our question asker, he's our podcaster. <laughs> so oh. thank you, Bob. <laughs> Sorry, I almost missed your, your plug there. But we do have a podcast, so please listen in. I'm on the one that's in this month, so listen to my voice more. <laughs> Excellent. If you'd like to fill out our survey to tell us how we're doing, please do so. Um, it's really quick. It takes like 60 seconds to do so. Oh, takes two minutes. Sorry, Roland. I forgot. <laughs> uh, we're so happy to have you all here. Thanks for joining us and we'll catch you next time. Thank you, everyone. I'll go ahead Thank and- Thank you, everyone.